And let's see. Is everyone seeing my uh, PowerPoint? No. Nope. No? OK, so let me redo that. Now we do. OK, good, good, good. So we will start here. So we want to welcome everyone again. Um, to Environmental Fridays. This is um, season six um, environmental of Environmental Fridays. It is personal. Uh, if you'd like to see our schedule for the entire um, year, 2023, 2024, and the speakers and their short bio, you could either click on that link or you could use the QR code. That will get you to our website. Uh, today, um, I have two co-hosts, um, one for the start of the presentation of the episode and one that will assist us with the Q&A. So our um, first, uh, co-host is right here on campus of Andrews University. She's recently, uh, I think it was last year, came on board. She's an assistant professor of communications and journalism. Professor Kara Harris is here with us today, and she will be introducing uh, Seth, our, our guest speaker. Our other co-host is Marcia Tinto. Uh, she is an uh, environmental educator in the Environment Management Authority in beautiful Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, she will assist with the Q&A. Uh, we just got to know each other over the Christmas break when I was back home. And uh, she and the Environment Management Authority will be working with us trying to promote Environmental Fridays um, in Trinidad and Tobago. So you will hear from her uh, here uh, later on as well. So at this point, I would like to introduce uh, Nandi Comer. She is a Port Laureate of Michigan. I believe she became the Poet Laureate back in 2023, I think. Um, and she actually was, uh, is the state's first Poet Laureate since the 1950s. Somehow or the other, they kind of like uh, lost their way or something, I don't know. But anyway, um, Nandi has brought that position back in full force. She also has the distinction of being the first African-American to hold that position. And part of what she does is pretty much go around the state of Michigan, visiting schools and libraries to promote poetry, spoken word, and literary, literary arts. So it's a pleasure to have her here with us today. So Nandi, I'm gonna have you go on now and do, do your thing for us to introduce um, us to this episode. Hi, thank you. Um, I just wanted to make sure, are you um, going to share this screen the whole time or are we gonna? Well, I'll, I'll get off and... Okay. Yes. But there you go. Hello, hello. Thank you everyone for joining this morning. Um, for me, a poet who usually doesn't leave the house before 10, this is quite early for a meeting, <laughs> but I'm sure folks at the university feel very, quite different about my poet life right now. Um, when I was asked to do this, I was really kind of stumped because I oftentimes really relish in urbanity and I really relish in being from a city and um, being in a space where um, there's a lot of interaction with the people. And so when I was asked to do, to bring some poems that were contemplating nature and the world around us, I know I have that. And part of that is because in Detroit, 
where I'm from and where I live, we really um, have spaces that we celebrate and consider our own. And one of those places is Bella, which is, um, it's an island mm -hmm. um, in the middle of the Detroit River where many of us uh, bring our families and celebrate. And so I know I've written so many poems about Belle Isle. So I brought a couple of Belle Isle poems and I've also, um, I brought a Belle Isle poem, but I also brought uh, poems to celebrate the river. Um, and there's one poem that I, I'll read in between just to kind of complicate things. So <laughs> okay. the first poem, <laughs> here's the first poem, Breathe Like It's Song for Belle Isle. Winter weaves a wind song that slits through a city. And I listen. A mother and her children scatter across the river's shoreline like beads to a broken necklace. The water sloshing under their shoes. Canada geese wobble between weeping willows. Your long fingers point and name a note between cloud and water. I plant a dull sound in dirt and myrtle oil, mark the mound with a leaf, watch note-like sprouts overtake grass, how concrete buckles under wiggle and stem. I skip beat on trails alongside a heap of brush while sheets of ice strike the bank, crash into rocks. This is no song for dead ears. You, island squatter, scoop up a mat, hike from our river, and dump it slapping in my lap. I listen to it starving to breathe. So this next poem, um, it's a complicated poem because I do love camping. I do love being in nature as much as I write about Detroit. Um, but my last time camping was right around um, as the, the onset of the pandemic started to um, become more of an everyday norm for us, a lot of us start took to nature because it was the few places where we could go and be outside and still convene amongst one another and still find space where we could be healthily, you know, have distance. And so my best friend and I tried to go camping and I brought this poem because I think it's also important for us to consider what spaces we don't deem as our own when we are trying to in, um, be out in the natural space, what happens sometimes to us when we try to enjoy those spaces. And so this poem, it's very new. And please excuse me if I take it slow. The Trump Boot, Camping in Michigan's Thumb. The root rods reach towards us as if trying to protect us from his message. He'd scratched in the, in the trail with the heel of his boot. A night for meteor showers. We are stargazers escaping light pollution and the city that birthed us. Are some major and minor, big and little dipper. We try to hold the constellation in our naked eyes. But there is a boot building a name in our path. Disrupting ritual, we are in the thumb of it all, Point Crescent, where there is a beach and trails to get lost in. A meteor shower so dark, where is my thumb? He stamped a boundary, drawing a line in the sand. Truth is we are amateurs. We don't know pine from cypress nor juniper from human. We are ready to get lost. Ahead of us, he scratches another name in the audience of moss and maple. We keep our distance. We hide our faces. We duck into the mouth of the trail. It is the end of the world, and all of us, all any of us wants to do is be outside forgetting. We can't get close to one another. We are in forest, unable to breathe about the end of the world. What about the end of the world that drives a middle-aged man to write a president's name in the sand? What about death makes us draw a line in the path with our foot and stand on a side, on one side? Are you good? Do you wanna go on? The hush of the dirt embarrassed by its route. We walked around it, sweet Trump's name from our path. 
At 1 a.m., I get to see silver slither streak through the dark sky. I get to forgive the shore, the waves, and the cracking over sand. The cliff of forest opened out on that shore. The many trails winding through old growth forests. We will always find our way to get lost in those trails. And this is the last poem. Um, I'm a big fan of Detroit River, but I realize it has spoiled me. I've gone places where people call things rivers and they look small to me. <laughs> so I, uh, this is a bit of a, a brag poem, but also a bit of a, a diss poem to a river that I, I encountered in Indiana, the river. The river holds its town folk under its tongue, overrunning the rim. The river never stops saying, it curves and covers the quiet of night. Chants gush, gush. Where I am now, there is no river. There is a small trickle of water the town calls river. A crooked creek thing with its draping trees and small bridge. Nothing for a child to drown or a car to sink. I could leap this shallow body if I tried. I might walk its deepest end. And this is how it tries to rehearse its vicious song. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So you really sh threw some shade on that stream, <laughs> that trickle. I, that was really... <laughs> no, I, it, I have been spoiled by our border river. <laughs> and I, I am, I'm grateful for all waterways because fresh water is, you know, one thing that is just a value in this, on this planet. But yeah. I also... You know, when I see these little small things that they call rivers, I'm like, you can't I know, right? really. <laughs> well, the next time you are in Southwest Michigan, we do have a river. I don't think okay. you will be able to throw shade on it. The syndrome. Okay, I look forward to seeing it. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much. Um, does anybody you. have just one question maybe for our port and then we move on? A, co a question or a comment? Um, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that, Nandi. Um, it made me think so much about what we have here and the fact that our rivers are not the way they used to be either. Mm -hmm. And I know Desmond would attest to that. Mm -hmm. They're much smaller. Um, because of pollution, because of land reclamation, because of so many environmental issues. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but from that second poem, I got this line, we will always find, we will, sorry, we will always find on, way, on our way to get lost in these trails. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's a line. Yeah. And um, it's very symbolic um, for me that we will always find a way to get lost because we're going down the path towards sustainability, but there's always something to distract us without us knowing that we're being distracted. Mm. Um, whether it be something regarding urbanization, some sort of um, you know, distraction, and I'm sure everyone can identify with that, or something that will, will, will um, get in the way of you continuing down that trail yeah. so thank you very much for that very thoughtful provoking thank you thank you so the poems you read nandy um a couple of them already in books are they published um could we find them online so we could share the first poem um well none of them are online right now okay. Um, okay. i i think i may work on the second one a little bit more and see if i can find a home for it okay. but the first was published in a detroit anthology called detroit where it's um poems and fiction and nonfiction of detroit writers i think it was published back in 2008 so it's a little bit of an older piece so. okay all yeah. right well yeah i'll communicate with you offline and see if we could get those um whatever you wish to share in terms of sending it out to our audience all right thank you again so next we will hear 
uh, from Professor Harris introducing our guest speaker for today. Right, good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's a privilege to be here. And so I'll be introducing our guest speaker, Seth Bornstein. He is a Washington-based national science writer for the Associated Press, the world's largest news organization. At the AP since 2006, his primary beat is climate change. He has covered disasters, hurricanes, the environment, astronomy, physics, and the space program for decades. He is the winner of numerous journalism awards, including the 2010 George Polk Award for Environment Reporting. He teaches journalism at New York University's Washington, D.C. campus. He's also the co-author of three out-of-print books, Andrew, Savagery from the Sea, Hurricane Survival Guide, and Dancing Honeybees. He has flown in zero gravity and once tried out for the Florida Marlins baseball team unsuccessfully. <laughs> uh, please welcome our guest speaker, Seth Bornstein. Okay, uh, thank, you. thank you very much, Kara. Uh, so first, I just want to make sure you understand I, I, I am not a scientist. Um, I'm not even a beekeeper uh, in terms of writing about bees and writing about science. Um, I write far more about climate change than I do about bees. But there is something ever since about 2006, 2007, there's been something about what's happening to the bees that I just can't shake. And um, even as I spend more and more time on other issues, it's so important that I always come back to bees and insects. Now, the trouble is, in, in journalism and almost everything in the world, we love to think in black and white, good and bad. Everything has to be very binary and simple. And we all know that that's not what life is. Mm -hmm. And no environmental problem it fits those gray areas more than bees mm -hmm. or, or the issue, not just of bees, because it's not just bees. It's the issue of insects and it's the issue of not just insects, but pollinators. And uh, not all pollinators are even insects. Bats can pollinate too. Um, and they're mammals. So one, th this is such a, a complicated, but important problem um, I just, I wanted to give you that little caveat. And like I said, I've been covering climate mostly, but my B reporting goes back about 16, 17 years. Um, and the reason you, you see, uh, it's not just a national issue. It's a global issue and it's not just bees. Uh, but but there is a lot of concern both in the United Nations, the federal government, and just everyday people on what's happening to bees. But just like I said, how complicated this is, you know, bees are not exactly just all wonderful and everything is great about them. Bees can be scary. They can be deadly. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have an allergy to bees which is a much more common allergy than many people think. Um, maybe it just seems that way to me because both my wife and daughter are allergic to bees. And we have a nice carpenter bee nest in our uh, front yard every spring. Um, to get to our car, you have to uh, dart through a mass of uh, swarming bees, which does not bother me, but certainly bothers my wife and daughter. Um, they have not been stung by those bees, mind you, because they're good bees. Um, but just to show, we we worry about shark attacks. We worry about snake bites. Bees, hornets, and wasps as a group, according to the CDC, kill about 72 Americans a year. Hmm. Um, and it's almost always through an allergic reaction. And you see, it's a fairly, this is the, you know, since 2011 to 2021, the deaths in the United States. That's more deaths than lightning, earthquakes, snake bites, and shark attacks combined. Uh, every semester, I, I teach my uh, journalism class about writing about risks. 
and we do it as a game show and I ask and I have them try to decide which is more dangerous and I usually put bees up against snakes and they almost always guess that snakes are more dangerous. It's not even close. Snakes kill about three or four people a year, bees more than 20 times that. Hmm. So the, 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 the bees are something you have to be careful about, especially if you're like, if you're like my wife and daughter, but they're vital to our lives. And one of this is something that people often don't think about, but about a third of the human diet comes from insect pollinated plants. Honeybee is the most um, famous of them. It's responsible for 80% of that pollination, uh, $20 billion annually to the U.S. Uh, agricultural industry. And just to tell you a little bit about what you eat or drink that gets pollinated. Um, if, uh, if you have a cup of coffee like I've been drinking this morning, coffee beans are pollinated. Chocolate is pollinated. Uh, apple, all sorts of fruits, nuts, berries, uh, vegetables, you name it. Um, the there it the list goes on, you know, in into the more than a hundred of our food groups are pollinated um in some ways, not always by by honeybees. Um, for example, chocolate is is pollinated by a stingless midge fly, but it is still pollinated. Um, and it goes back to what you were taught about the birds and the bees. The these crops don't get anywhere without the bees bringing in the pollen, cranberries, coconut, cherries, figs. There are eight hundred types of wasps that pollinate figs. Um, I I used to, when I lived in Florida, I had a mango tree in my backyard mm -hmm. that was pollinated. Uh, eat tea plants, tomatoes tequila if you like that bats are bats do the agave for te tequila um so this is it is so very important if we lost all our pollinators we would lose an awful lot um, but bees are in trouble and here again is where it gets complicated there are a lot of types of bees hundreds of types of bees and we really only keep track well of one type, the honeybee. And even in the honeybees, we do a better job of keeping track of one type. So, and when you think of bees, most people will think of honeybees, but picture a bumblebee. Mm -hmm. The bumblebee is the thing you see around your yard often, the big fat thing that usually doesn't have, you don't have to worry too much about stinging you. Um, and it does pollinate, but it's, it's not the most efficient pollinator. And most importantly, it's not one that we harness. We have learned as a society how to harness honeybees. And so there are millions of honeybee colonies in the United States. And those are there, there are commercial honeybee colonies, and then there are backyard honeybee colonies, hobby beekeepers. Um, you know, Nandi talked about being urban, you know, mostly writing about urban areas. There are many urban beekeepers. People can keep bees on the roof of, of apartment buildings and, mm -hmm. and high rises. You can keep bees all over, um, and it is a way to bring um, nature into the city, but we mostly track commercial honeybees, and these are people, big operators, it's uh, the big ag part of bees, and these are people who actually truck hives from place to place. In February, January, February, they're hitting California, and they are about to pollinate the California almond crop. Um, and there are trucks just full of bees traveling to California right now or in there already. Mm -hmm. And so these are kept well um, kept track of. Uh, the U.S. Ag uh, Department of Agriculture keeps track of them. Others keep track of them. 
There's a consortium out of the University of Maryland that does a uh, regular survey. So if you look at it around 1988, 89, we were at a three and a half million honeybee, commercial honeybee colonies. And by the time we hit about 2006, that was down to about 2.3 million. That's a, it was a loss of one third. That's a big loss in honeybees. Mm -hmm. And this area here in the 2006 to 2008 area, that dip you see in that graph, that's when things suddenly got scary. And scientists started saying something is happening to bees. Um, and they call and they they gave it a name called uh, colony collapse disorder or CCD. And it was a mystery. What was it? Um, and that's when I I got, started paying attention to bees. Since then, levels have gone up a little, but now there are a lot more um, studies and surveys and and just keeping track of bees. And so every year now, the Bee Informed Partnership, which is run out of University of Maryland. Oh, you're not seeing the slides? I am so sorry. I didn't share. We have, I apologize. Let's share this. I forgot about. Yeah, I, I, you were doing a pretty good job there. I'm just <laughs> talking. I know, okay, I you see really, it now. Oh, I'm really enjoying good. the talk. Yeah. Uh, so I did. All right. There we go. You should okay. see it now. I apologize. Okay. No yep. problem. Um, so here, let me um, let me go back and just show you the one thing. Uh, okay. There we go. You, you should now see that, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, I'm now I'm going the wrong direction. All right. This is the big drop you see from 1989 to 2008. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. That's the only slide of importance that we missed. <laughs> <laughs> so this Be Informed Partnership, um, they now look at commercial beekeepers, um, backyard beekeepers, sideline beekeepers. And they're basically those three groups are designed are, are defined by how much bees they keep. Um, you and I would be considered backyard. Um, and originally beekeepers, th this group only, if you see, you look around 2008 to 2011, it's only in blue because the surveys only looked at winter. Winter is the hardest season for bees. Um, all you have to do is go outside right now, especially in Michigan, to figure that out. Uh, it's not nice weather for bees. Mm -hmm. They tend to stay in their hives. And um, and that's where you have the biggest loss. So they started tracking it. And then they ch started tracking summer uh, loss and, and then created annual losses. And if you take a look at this, this is the, the latest figures. They come out in April of every year. Um, last year, um, the winter of 22 to 23, beekeepers lost 48% of their managed colonies. Hmm. That's not 48% of their bees. It's 48% of their colonies. It's hmm. not the highest. It, a few years earlier, it was even higher. Um. And that's commercial beekeepers, um, mostly. Uh, in general, backyard beekeepers even have a worse time. Hmm. But it, they're, they're a small number. Um, and, but if you look at this graph, you see it goes up and down, up and down. Um, so if you know, I tell you nearly half the bee, they lost nearly half their colonies. That sounds horrendous. It is horrendous, except beekeepers especially commercial beekeepers have learned how to cope with this they basically split their oftentimes they split their colonies and um in springtime and late winter create new colonies out of old mm -hmm. so that's why this is not as scary as it looks but it's still scary because this isn't the number of bees they don't count the number of bees they just count the colonies um, and so they take, um, the create a new colony, create a new queen and, and it's not as good. Uh, it's weaker. You, you take a strong hive and, and a st strong colony and, and split it into two weaker ones, but eventually they get better. 
But that shows you the pro you know, how it's gotten to be a problem. But if you're my age, and I know some of you are, when you were <laughs> in the 1970s and 60s and even the early 1980s, if you did a road trip, and I grew up in, in um, Columbus, Ohio, and we would drive to Florida to see my grandparents every year. And when you drove, you would see your windshield look a little like this. Um, splotted windshield with lots of bugs on it. And this is where it points out this is not just a bee problem. This is all a flying insect problem. Edward O. Wilson, E. O. Wilson, is a Pulitzer, was a Pulitzer Prize-winning biologist. He grew up here in Washington, D.C. Um, 80 years ago, and he would talk, um, I talked to him about a couple years before he died, and he would tell me how Washington was alive with insects, especially butterflies. Um, he would, as a kid, just wander, and they'd be everywhere. Um, and he would do this drive and his windshield would look like this. But now he says those fly, you know, now, and this was a few years ago, those flying insects are virtually gone. In 2017, he, he was a professor at Harvard and uh, he drove from suburban Boston to Vermont and decided to count how many bugs hit his windshield. And it was only one moth in about a three, four hour drive. That's something. Even twenty years ago, you it was you know you used to see far more of those, and these bugs are important. Um, well, Wilson wrote that if all mankind were to disappear, the world would regenerate back to the rich state of equilibrium that existed ten thousand years ago. If insects were to vanish, the environment would collapse into chaos. Because the insects are are the base of our life. Um, it's the base of our food, our food supply. And as I said, it's not just bees, it's butterflies, it's moths, it's all sorts of flying insects. Um, it's also non-flying insects. And you know, we we take them for granted. We squish them when we can, um, even though we probably shouldn't. You know, the the uh, Wilson made his career studying ants and the intricate society of ants showing, hey, it's not just humans who have these amazing abilities. So about two, three years ago now, three years ago um, this week, uh, there was a study in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences that looked at how much the insect world has lost in the last several years. And they called it death by a thousand cuts. Um, and this it's uh, global warming, droughts, deforestation, insecticides, uh, invasive species, urbanization, pollution, uh, all sorts of things. And it's not, it's not just each of these individually, it's how they interact. Uh, all you have to do is go out, if you're of a certain age, just go outside, spend some time, and you'll just see less bugs out there. Or do the do the drive in the windshield test, and you'll notice it. It, it is truly different. So the next question would be, why? And for bees, as I said, this, this all became a big issue in, in 2006, 2007 with colony collapse disorder. And that's what everyone wanted to find. What's causing colony collapse disorder? And after several years, they ended up saying, well, it's not one thing, it's a lot of things. So the biggest issue right now, and it changes, is uh, parasites. Bees get even littler bugs in them um and the and there are many of them there there's a vampire um, parasite that's been hitting vermont um that turns that um got nicknamed that because basically it takes over semi-dead bees the the parasite just takes over 
you know, like I'm sorry, not vampires, zombie. So they become so they they're called zombie bees because the bees aren't really controlling themselves anymore. The the parasites are. But the biggest one is this little bugger on the left here. Um, that orange thing, it's called it gets nicknamed Varroa. It is a mite. Its actual name is even better. It's called Varroa destructor. And it is killing off bees. It gets attached to bees. And then it um, it spreads in hives. So you get Varroa in a hive. It starts spreading from bee to bee. And you have a serious problem. And it's not just the parasites. The parasites then weaken the uh, bee and they get viruses and other diseases. And sometimes it works the other way around. They get diseases, which weakens them and a parasite attacks. Uh, so there's all sorts of diseases. There's all sorts of parasites. And then there are pesticides. We you know, try to kill off all sorts of insects and other critters that are not useful and that are harmful because there are harmful insects to our crops and to our gardens um there is a particular type of pesticide that has been linked more and more often to bee deaths it's called a neonicotinoid nicotinoid and if you notice the yes, the phrase nicotine is in there because it does it is based on nicotine uh, it is used for other crops, but it has an effect on bee nervous system. And there have been studies after study that have shown problems, but it is still legal in the United most of the United States. There are certain states like New York that have worked to ban them. Europe has worked to ban them, but they're still around. And you don't have to spray them on the bee if it's nearby. Um they some the the uh, neonicotinoids sometimes spread a little, and do you remember bees move around a lot? So you may not spray it where the bee is, but if the bee comes to where it's been sprayed, then you have a problem. But that's not all. Another big issue is habitat loss. Bees need places to go, places to get pollen. They need food. They need flowers, they need plants, and we are building up. Um, we are bulldozing, we are doing all sorts of things that is uh, do, that makes bees lose, me, bees and other pollinators lose their, their habitat. For bees especially, there's a, a problem that goes along with that. Um, as farming and agriculture becomes in more industrial, and it has over the last few decades, there's something called mono farming or uh, we mono crops. You tend to get giant fields of one crop, often a crop that bees do not need or use. So bees are losing the weeds, the flowers, um, the wildflowers that they that they that they pollinate that they use for food and forage so it that's a problem and then you have climate change which <coughs> exacerbates some of these other issues and then there seems to be some issues with drought uh flooding that affects uh, and extreme weather can affect hives and colonies but it, like i said it's not any of these uh, in um, singular, they also interact. And you have, so you have these all sorts of, whoops, all sorts of problems. But one of the differences between this problem and other environmental problems is, for example, if you're looking at climate change, yes, you can reduce your carbon footprint. You can use electric vehicles, based on um, renewable energy, you can change your power uh, from your home, you can have a smaller carbon footprint. And that is a general good thing, but 
the problem of climate change is so huge, individual efforts, while important, only add up in the giant method in, in, in larger ways. Um, it's more an issue you to solve climate change you need big government action changes in society change you know basically changes in 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 the way we live our lives and pow power our lives which is not something the every average day person can do but when it comes to bees and insects and other pollinators there you have more power this is something where you have more ability, especially if you have a yard, but not only that, you can be a beekeeper, but one of the best things you can do is to plant a bee garden. Um, there are, and, it's, and, and it, what's important is a bee garden in Michigan is gonna be a different bee garden than here in suburban Maryland where I live. And it's going to be different than in Florida or Trinidad and Tobago or California or Colorado. You want um, native uh, native plants. And by the way, speaking of native plants, we you know we I've been talking about the honeybee. The honeybee is not a native bee to the United States. As much as we're spending all this time and effort, honeybee was imported. Most of them. Were, the ones we are we use here in North America were imported from Europe, often from Italy. But it is what we use now, um, and what you're doing, what you would be can do at home is actually more helpful toward wild bees, toward bumblebees, carpenter bees, and so you 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 look up native plants for pollinators uh, here. Um, the Great Lakes, you have one type, I have others. Uh, many of these wildflowers, you just plant them, make sure they get a, a proper amount of water. Then you don't have to worry about them. You know, weeds, there are certain weeds that are actually good, so it's all right. As long as you're happy with the way it looks. And some of, uh, there are some beautiful uh, bee gardens that you know, are functional and and beautiful. You can uh, limit or not use pesticides at all. Uh, New York just recently signed a ban. Um, the New York government just recently uh, approved a ban on uh, neonicotinoids. And then remember that a lot of the bees we talk about are ground bees, like my carpenter bees in my house. They they live underground. These are bumblebees, ground nesting bees. They need often mulch free, uh, well drained, protected soil. So, come spring and fall, I've noticed, so especially in my neighborhood, you get the smelly mulch put on people's yards. And you know they're they're trying to get nice gardens, um, and lovely lawns. Lovely lawns may be pretty to look at. They don't do anything for bees. Mm -hmm. um, so you want grounds. You you want holes for these bees. You want them to be able to live somewhere. Um, but you also have to remember that for some people, bees are going to be dangerous, mm -hmm. and even getting stung by a bee obviously is not any fun. I've been stung by bees several times. Um, it uh, I'm not luckily not allergic. Uh, my wife and daughter do bring, carry their epipens with them whenever they go out out, um, and we have them easily near the front door. So, but it it is an important thing, and and it's like so much in life we take for granted what's around us and there's nothing more around us that we take for granted than bees and the rest of the insect world out there and that, so that's I'm, I'm not and my job is never to advocate and i don't it's to observe this and i think that's the 
if you spend time observing ants like E.O. Wilson did for much of his life, you can't help but get um, have this respect and awe of nature and the world around us. And we just often don't stop and look at it. And we and we have the power to protect that world a little bit better than we can now. And it benefits us. And it's it's our food. So I don't know if that's any help. Um, but if we want to do any questions. All right. Yes. Uh, thank you so much, um, Seth. This has been very good. Um, one of the things that I think thought about uh, in the last uh, part of your talk is, and I have a sort of like soapbox on this, is the dandelion. So it's considered to be a seed, but I just looked it up while you were talking. Dandelion pollinators, they include hummingbirds, they include uh, three or four different types of butterflies. Um, and so, you know, Things that we classify uh, sometimes as weeds actually are contributing to the, our ecosystem in, in positive ways. Anyway, thanks again. Um, let's, Marcia, um, any comments or questions that you have, Marcia? Hi, yes. I, I really um, appreciated that presentation. Because very often we do not associate bees with it's all it's all condensed in biodiversity, which mm. seems to be not aligned to climate change or any of the other issues we discussed. Um, I'm always very um bent on showing linkages, mm -hmm. and I think this presentation really brought forward the linkages, the things that are happening that are causing the decline in bee population. Um, one of the things you said um, really stood out as well, the fact that um, in many, many, many countries, well, Europe, of course, I shouldn't say of course, but Europe particularly, and I think the state of New York, have um, banned that particular pesticide. Mm -hmm. um, but for some reason, we're not connecting that pesticides are not, um, well, not safe. Um, so we want to have our flowers, we want to have our vegetation, but at the same time, we are doing things to destroy that. And I think it's a mindfulness that's necessary um, among um, our environmentalists and, and the population at large, that if we want to have our vegetation, our green spaces and so on, and lovely flowers, um, we have to deal with these insects that we want to kill because they sting us. Mm -hmm. You know, and I try all the time to say to people, don't kill the bees, um, or there's a bee, you know, and, and they try to spray it or swat it or whatever they can. Um, and I think it, it it takes a lot for people to really um, internalize that whole, um, what should I say, the importance mm -hmm. of, of connecting the, import, the, the bee population to the things that we like and we enjoy in nature, the aesthetics. Mm -hmm. So, and, and it's interesting too, being a journalist and doing a lot of work in climate change, which I do as well. And I did journalism years ago. And I think it's 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 a good thing that you've been able to align all these all these disciplines together. So again, I want to stress, um, and I might be preaching to the converted, but you don't have to be specialized in a particular area to have the interest or the concern or to even do research on it, because mm -hmm. everything is connected. So thank you very much for that presentation and for really um, reinforcing some of the things that we already know, but sometimes we do forget. Thank you. Very good. So uh, are there other 
comments and questions, Susan? Yes, thanks, Seth. That was really interesting. Um, two questions. One is um, this colony collapse syndrome was identified in what, 2007 or something, six or seven, you said. And I'm wondering if now that it's 15 years later, is it getting worse or is it getting better? And my second question is, um, why aren't you a beekeeper yourself? <laughs> um, well, the second one is easier to answer why am I not a beekeeper myself? Because I have a wife and daughter who are allergic. Oh, of course. Of course. I, you know, it is, you know, and I understand their 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 concern. Um it is a it is a matter. I mean, I have taken my wife to the emergency room five, six times. <laughs> oh. Um wow. There, there there have been you know, that I think it was April of every year for four years, there was wow. always one allergic reaction. Sometimes it isn't bees, it's a, another insect. Um, but that's a the the main in reason for that. It's uh, <laughs> um, but it's also going to be honest. It's an expensive hobby. Um, hmm. You know, you have to get if you're going to do it right. You have to have the equipment of you know the full suit. But hmm. I spent. I have friends who are beekeepers. Hmm. Um, I have way too much homemade honey at right now in my house. <laughs> um, <laughs> But it, it they, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, some of it is unfortunately solidified. Uh, um, <laughs> but in terms of colony collapse disorder, mostly what science after a few years, scientists have stopped using the phrase as much because they they've realized it's not one thing. Yeah. This the the phrase. What what happened is they noticed this dramatic drop, and so they had to come up with a name for what's happening. Mm -hmm. But as they studied it further, they they decided they figured this is so many other things. So things bottomed out around two thousand, anywhere between two thousand six to two thousand nine, and since then, uh, thing the we're seeing some stabilization it's uh going up and down every year you know every couple of years there's some good years there's some bad years um i've been i i've covered where when they have dramatic 50 percent uh loss in colonies and then years where they have 10 or 15 percent loss in colonies loss they expect a loss every year because that's just nature mm -hmm. um so it goes up and down but it's it's better than it was 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. It's, um, okay. I don't know if we fra phrase stabilize works, but mm -hmm. it's not as severe. Mm -hmm. um, okay. That's good to know. One of the things that happened, by the way, is um, the Obama administration, because this was done in the Obama administration, they decided to put more wildflowers all around highways in the medians. Mm. I don't know if you noticed that while driving and it's not happening everywhere, but that is a, a, a simple, um, not complete solution, mm. but but it helps. Mm. And you know, you put wildfire flowers in a highway median, that means you don't have to mow them. And, uh, uh, um, and, and bees, you know, they can fly over the traffic. Mm -hmm. so um mm. cool so, yeah um just oh one other thing going back to what marcia said in terms of biodiversity when you all think of biodiversity i'm sure you mostly think of you know what what's biologists called uh charismatic megafauna mm. you know, <laughs> polar bears and oh, okay. charismatic <laughs> megafauna love that um i know i haven't heard that phrase before <laughs> okay. um, but it, it 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 but you think of beautiful animals you know bears and deer and lions and when you 
the insects or uh, world, the ter uh, terrestrial arthropods. Hmm. That's a billion tons. If you took all the insects in the world, right. that's a billion <laughs> metric tons. Mm -hmm. Humans are 400 million tons. Farm mm -hmm. animals are 600 million tons. So the insects of the world, even though they're so tiny, they weigh the same as all the people and our farm animals together. Wow. Wow. So the, yeah. the little things that run the world. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So one of the questions that came that this you know topic triggers uh for me is there is the phenomenon of um commercial fake honey. Um, have you looked into that? Have you do you have any thoughts? I, I, I have started to see that. I haven't looked into it. Um but it actually, I've, I've been getting um, all sorts of ads about it, um, and I, ha I haven't looked at it, uh, mostly because I just don't buy honey as much. Okay, uh, you, so, so. your friends give it to you? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think it's, it's, I've heard it's a thing, that you have to be yeah. much more careful now when you go to the supermarket and looking for honey, that it is actually the real natural honey. Well, that would make sense. Um, yes. Buying them from farmer's markets also is a good way of doing that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, su supporting local bee, make bee, you know, bee enthusiasts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, other questions? There's a word for those people. What? Isn't there a word for people who raise bees? Beekeepers. 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 I thought there was some scientific Happy, name. Apiculture. Apiculture. Uh, yeah, apiculture is the name of the uh, of oh, the sign. Okay. Of, right. Okay. But um yeah, the difference between the birds and the bees, um, if you if you, is just one letter, an apiary versus an aviary. Yes, yes. Apiary, that's it. Apiary, yeah. uh-huh, uh-huh. So um, Pat, out there in Trinidad, any any uh, thoughts about bees, I, pollinators no, I, in Trinidad and the Caribbean, maybe? I have been listening with um, great interest. Maybe of additional interest to you all is that then about 1900, between 1900 and 19... Oh, two, I think it was. One of the governor's wives in Trinidad, a lady Broom, her name was, hmm. she wrote all sorts of things. And in one of her books, she had an, a mention of watching the stingless bee hive in the, not hive, but the nest in the Botanic Gardens and how they protected their, 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 their nest by closing it up at night so that because of course being stingless bees they couldn't protect themselves under the normal system mm. so at night they were particularly vulnerable so the last one in effectively closed the hive but oh wow That's <laughs> closed it closed it at the bottom and he was describing that but wow in Trinidad at the moment there is a UNDP best net project ongoing and one of their emphasis is on the stingless bee increasing and in, increasing the stingless bee population and encouraging that. So I thought that could be of interest as well. But one of the main problems that we find in Trinidad is when it came to our pollinator garden for butterflies we were concentrating on was trying to find these native plants. Mm -hmm. that native plants used to grow along the, as you say, along the highways and on the verges. But now we have something called CPEP, which goes along and it cuts all the plants along the highways. Mm -hmm. So we have lost a tremendous number of our native plants, which makes it very difficult to bring back our native pollinators. Just a thought. Thank mm -hmm. you very much, though, for this very interesting session.
Yeah, that's that's interesting about this the the workers that do this. Yeah. Um I I wonder if any thought has been given to like a balance though, because I understand why they may want to cut down some of of the you know um vegetation and plants and stuff, but there has to be some balance trap because as you said, um, this is what the the pollinators need, the insects need, the, you know, the butterflies. Um, so you're absolutely correct. And we have tried. The problem is lack of, um, of uh, educating, the lack of education given to the people who are A, supervising, and be working mm. in these um but it's really brought me back this is something that we're going to have to get working on again thank you very much <laughs> all right sounds good other mm. comments and questions yes i just wanted to follow through on the cpap program um i'm trying to remember what the acronym is for but it's 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 really providing jobs for people right mm -hmm. and i remember when it was first implemented back in probably 2003 or four i'm not quite sure but there was training so there was a period of maybe a two or three week training before these people were put out to work to beautify because that was part of the mandate to beautify not just to clean Mm -hmm. And I remember we had done a few sessions with them. They they had different stakeholders coming in, whether it be to talk about um the importance of plants, you know, botany, um, aesthetics. There were quite a number of things, but somehow that 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 has stopped and it's just about, you know, getting jobs. Yeah. And yes, it's important. But then I think too, and this is not just applicable to Trinidad and Tobago. Right. Um we find that we have someone who is um, trained well, is supposed to be doing something and they really don't need to know anything else. Mm -hmm. you're, you're there to do or to manage or to do road works and that's it. You don't need to know what else. So, I mean, the onus is on us. I mean, it's part of our fault as well why we have people um, who, who do maintenance and these other things who who really don't know and they don't understand because there is no proper guidance and training. Or if it does happen, it's not sustained. Right. That's, that's what I was precisely, say. Yeah, pre it's, precisely where I was coming from. Thank you very much, Marcia. Yeah, it probably does need a continuous uh, training. Right. Or if, if you don't want to use the word training, at least reminders that, you know, this is what you um should do shouldn't do yeah all right um other other questions or comments all right if if not we want to again thank uh Seth for bringing this important um issue to the fore because thank you for having me yes because based on the um, United Nations Environment Program, loss of biodiversity is one of the global threats. It's, you know, pollution, climate change, and loss of biodiversity. So this was a drill down into one aspect of that. And the uh, linkages, as uh, Marcia said, are important in any ecosystem. Like, you know, you, br you, you break one link, that affects the whole system. Um, so it's really good to have you talk to us about that and we wish you continued, um, well, success and continuing educating <laughs> and bringing awareness to, to the public. When was the last time you, you wrote on a biodiversity? Uh, you said you were doing mostly climate change now? Yes. Um, oh, I would say it probably last fall last um, okay okay i uh, it is time again to bring back but yes. um one of the issues is we hired someone to 
specialize in that. So, Okay, okay, good. so I, she does it more often than I. It's not that we're not covering it. It's just we've got more people doing it, which is good. This is good. This is good. Except she, I, I, I still ask her to let me do insects. All right, that sounds good. <laughs> that sounds good. So we could keep following you at the Associated Press. Um, yes. I've, I've looked at some of your recent articles. Very, very good. And I think you did a interview also on YouTube. So just look up, um, Seth. Uh huh. Yes. Um. Yeah. I, um. Yes. I. Uh. It was a. Uh, from my front yard in the snow about the cold weather and how we can have cold weather and climate change at the same right, time. Right, right. The one I remember is the record heat yeah. temperature yes. 2023 and a prediction that 2024 is going to get even worse. Yes. Yeah. So keep up this good work, man. This is really important work. that well, you're doing. Thank you. I will continue to follow you online. Thank and you I so think, much. I think we have to keep on encouraging people to plant trees everywhere, please. That's right. That's But right. they have to be the right type of trees. Yes. One of the problems that has happened, <laughs> is, especially with climate change, is oh, let's just plant trees and people plant non-native trees mm -hmm. um, absolutely right so you when you do something you have to do the right type mm -hmm. my tree and your tree are not if i uh, yeah you don't want me planting um mid-atlantic trees right. in either michigan or trinidad and tobago right exactly and um, unfortunately the trees that would survive used to survive well in trinidad and tobago can now survive in washington but they shouldn't <laughs> <laughs> yes uh, but unfortunately yes and there's a big argument there uh in many ways in the botanic gardens because in the botanic gardens we kind of have a look to have to keep the balance between encouraging native trees but also to keep the historical and cultural aspects mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of them and so therefore we do plant non-native trees as well yeah. <laughs> of course and, and, and it, if you think about it it's like a botanical garden is like a zoo you right. want precisely a diverse precisely. but you don't want people leaving the botanical garden <laughs> and then planting non-native somewhere in their homes right. no right. good point thank you very much <laughs> all right so thank you all for Coming to our second episode of Environmental Fridays, season six. And next week, we will actually be hearing from someone from Trinidad and the Caribbean. So our very first three presentations have been uh, pretty broad and diverse. We had Native American actresses on last week. This week, we have a uh, Associated Press journalists on honeybees next week we go to the caribbean so tell your friends invite your network and we'll see you again next week friday for environmental fridays have a great weekend thank you dr thank murray you. thank you seth thanks all thank we you. enjoyed bye. it thank bye. you thank you all right bye-bye thanks bye-bye